Hello world. Hi everybody who's joined us on Zoom um, and thank you so much for being here. Um, we are launching the trade and development report for 2021 and I, um, I can't help but remember the last time I did this, which was two years ago. It was in person um, and it feels like a century ago because since then everything has changed. Um, Fortunately, this report is about a lot of those things, but it's also about how, in a lot of ways, not that much has changed um, over the past 40 years. Uh, you know, governments are, are, are stuck in the same cycles of austerity. Um, there are so many political obstacles to making the world better, obviously. Um, and UNCTAD has been at the forefront of advocating against this type of thinking for, you know, four decades now. Um, if you haven't already read the report. I highly recommend it because it's not only an inspiring way forward, but it's a great concise, yes, I said concise, way, um, a, a great summary um, of what the hell has happened in the global economy in the past 40 years. As a non-economist, I found it really useful um, just to have it all laid out in one place in, in such a clear manner. Uh, so if you are a student or somebody who's learning about economics, um, go ahead and read it or skim it. It's a terrific piece of work and I'm so pleased to be introducing uh, the latest version. Um, so you see our panels, panelists today. Um, we have Anastasia Nesvetailova um, uh, of City uh, University. Uh, we have Nelson Barbosa. Um, and we have uh, Richard Kozel Wright, who's been working on the um, TDR for, for some time. So I'm going to start for, with a question for Richard, since he's, um, he's the old timer here. Um, Richard, can you tell me a little bit about how this report started off and, and where it's taken you uh, over the course of your career? Yeah, thanks, Atossa, for that introduction. I should say that both Anastasia and Nelson also worked on the report. So they have they're wearing they have two hats but the hat right now is as as authors of the report um yeah obviously 18 months into the pandemic when we began writing this report it, it was a reflection on on what we've learned to some extent over that over that period but it, it was going to do so through a couple of longer lens one was the lens of the lessons from the global financial crisis and and given that was the last big shock to the global economy uh, what what lessons we might take from that and whether we've learned very much or not in terms of handling uh, this kind of shock and of course as you said because it was the 40th anniversary of the report it was also an opportunity to use the lens of 40 years of what we call swimming against the tide to kind of think about um, the, 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 the current conjuncture uh, in the context of what we've been saying about essentially four years of, uh, 40 years of, of neoliberalism. Uh, the, the TDR was born the same year that Ronald Reagan took over the presidency of the United States. So we've had a, we've had a direct window onto that uh, experience. Um, and, and so that, that was one thing we wanted to do. I mean, obviously, the report also wants to take a look at what's exactly going on at the current moment and and I guess we'll 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 have questions uh, about that. Um, I guess in terms of what I mean the, the question that you posed right at the beginning is um, is uh, uh, whether the kind of policy debate around development issues has shifted as a consequence of the pandemic in our favor in terms of in terms of this alternative to the neoliberal uh, tradition that has dominated uh, over that period, um, and and I guess I guess it's uh, it the report doesn't draw any definitive con conclusions, but there's some I think there's some broad lessons that we take uh, that kind of begin to answer that question. Um, I mean, the first obvious point to make is that states almost everywhere are, were unprepared for this shock. Uh, and that, to some extent, has to do with the rise of liberalism, which has demonized the state for four decades. And so it is perhaps not surprising that that would be the, the case. There's questions about some states doing better than others, but the broad, no one was really prepared for this. And I don't think any, and 
very few states come out well from this experience. And so, so that lack of preparedness is, is an important lesson we take. And it's a worrying lesson because this pandemic in many respects is a trial run for future shocks that are almost certainly going to be more uh, uh, damning and damaging than, than this one, at least from a, if we take the climate science seriously, we, we might want to talk about that um, uh, subsequently. So that lack of, prepare, of preparedness was, is a certain lesson. On the other hand, you know, states have done a lot more than the neoliberals say states could or should do. And the, the response, particularly amongst advanced economies, obviously, in terms of uh, responding with a degree of urgency and at scale to this crisis has been quite remarkable given uh, the, the ideological uh, landscape of the, of the last four, four, four decades. And the notion that there is no alternative to some extent has been blown out of the water uh, by, by this um, crisis. So, so that, there's an there is a certain ambiguity in terms of what happens next from that experience. I think the, another big lesson that obviously comes out of it, and again speaks to that question, is just is the extent to which the pandemic has exposed uh, the inequalities and divisions uh, within and across countries. I mean that's that's become uh, a, a fairly apparent. The, the, the pandemic has, in many respects, exaggerated those inequalities uh, and divisions. It's exposed just how fragile, to some extent, how unhappy the world has become. The lack of trust that, that, that follows from that is a feature both of uh, uh, within countries at the national level, but also at the, multi, the multilateral uh, level and the international level too. And I guess that's a fourth, that's the, the, the kind of fourth lesson is about the state of multilateralism in terms of its response to this crisis and whether it's proved um, able to handle this kind of shock in a, in, a, in, a, in a timely and fair and efficient manner. And the answer to that is clearly no. I mean, that's, that's clear. I mean, one of the big lessons I think that comes out of the report is just how indifferent advanced economies have been to the kind of hit that developing countries have taken as a consequence of this, of this crisis. And as, as we show in the report, for many parts of the developing world, this was much more da damaging than the global financial crisis. And the response in terms of fiscal support, in terms of the vaccine question, in terms of uh, uh, debt relief uh, from the international community has, has been nothing like what was needed for countries to be able to manage this kind of shock. So, so those are those are some of the kind of broad lessons I think that we've we've drawn from the, the, this year's report. Great. Well, we'll get into all of these um, themes in a little bit more detail. But um, I'd love to start off by asking our panelists what they make of the state of the state at the moment. Because on one hand, in the U.S., in the U.K., in a lot of European countries, we have had unprecedented um, fiscal stimulus, um, you know, assistance with wages. Um, assist, um, they, for a while in the US, we had a moratorium on evictions. So there has been a pretty robust response in that respect. On the other hand, I don't, I, I mean, in my 35 years, um, I can't remember a time when the state was less trusted, more reviled, and had failed in one of its really basic jobs, which is to keep people safe. And so I'm wondering how these two strands, on one hand, you have a, a, a strong state when it comes to you know, supporting economies. On the other hand, utter failure, right? Um, how, does that, how does that square and, and how is that gonna play out um, in the future? Maybe uh, Anastasia, you can, you can start us off. Thanks, Alosa. It's a complex question clearly because the state is not usually one entity, it's an assemblage of institutions and definitely people. So what you are saying is absolutely correct in a sense that there is a paradox of kind of feeling of sensation. On the one hand, we definitely see, at least the hand of the government has become very visible in most economies through handouts, through support, through um, if necessary bailouts, through special programs. On the other hand, this comes after, as Richard said, of, of several decades of progressive weakening of um, state institutions, the role of the state as an economic structure or economic agent, if you want, 
um, also the ideas or the ideational sphere, the perceptions of what the state should, can, and um, must do to society or for society. All this clearly has left a mark. Um, and, you know, probably sociologists will be writing a lot of works on how governmental elites have handled this crisis and how competent or not they have been. And I think, as you said, there are a lot of stories of incompetence, but um, historically, if you kind of take a stack of what has happened over several decades now, one paradox of the post-2007 to 2009 development or economic evolution, definitely in Anglo-Saxon economies and in, in, in partly European too, is actually how dependent we have been on unseen state support. Uh, chiefly that makes central banks and the monetary stimulus and, and various um, kind of unofficial uh, support channels to the financial sector, the corporate lobby, um, and the kind of the, the support infrastructure to the private interests. That comes from the state. In fact, if markets, you talk about markets, if markets are worried about something, if they're very uncertain about some risks, that if you talk to investors, you realize they're absolutely terrified that the state will suddenly start to withdraw its support. They have no idea what to do if that happens. They have become so addicted to uh, liquidity injections, to again, support to easy money, to, to, cheap, um, to cheap profits that, uh, I'm not sure they, they a, a crisis or a shock or a, 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 an episode of volatility can be avoided if suddenly actually the states do what they're presumed to do in a very neoliberal way to say, okay, guys, you are now on your own. We're not buying your assets. We're not supporting failing corporations or monopolies. We're withdrawing support from the markets and we're not doing any more quantitative easing in any way. This will be quite a... Um, quite a, a big shock to, to private, definitely private financial markets. They don't know what to do. So it's a, it's a very strange and in some ways very jittery time in terms of understanding what the state should be doing as, a, as an institution or as a set of institutions. Um, we, the world was here uh, some 70 years ago, post uh, Second World War in 1944-45 when world economies were similarly damaged by a major crisis, that was the Second World War itself, and poverty and, and, and destruction unleashed by, the, by that particular war. And it took some time for people to agree on a set of ideas and institutional principles and to put them into implementation of what to do and how, this, how the new state should act into new reality, in the new reality. So I think um, it can just be that this moment is upon us and upon the state, whether the current political elites are in a position to, uh, to, to do something about that, that remains a, a big and open question. And Richard mentioned quite correctly that, you know, there are a lot of reasons for pessimism, um, but at least it's important to realize that I think we're in, in, a, in a transition moment from one model um, or one re political, political economic regime into another. What that another regime would be, it's an open question, partly because also um, just as we now have seen the usefulness, the imperative of state support in, 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 in a crisis stricken economy, <clears throat> there is um, some expectation in, in the private sector that actually the pandemic can move us closer to a stateless economy, to a completely privatized, fragmented, uh, silo digital world where we all exist only as individual, very optimistic agents. And uh, actually, as you said, all, all old institutions uh, will be discredited and will have very little um, role in, in, in that particular extreme. So I think that's one of the bigger dangers of the, if you want, long-term perspective on what pandemic has meant for the state. So it's, a, it's an identity moment, identity discovery moment, but to what extent people will react to it it's a, remains an open question. Yeah, this idea that we're between systems or between regimes is, is compelling and also a bit scary because it, yeah. it can clearly go either way. Exactly. Um, Nelson, maybe you could uh, speak a little bit about um, the role of central banks in this and, and, and um, 
inflation and, and how that uh, conversation has evolved uh, over the past uh, couple of years? Yeah, well, uh, central banks initially, they avoided the, the financial effect of the crisis. There was the usual quantitative easing, very low interest rates, and that, that part has already played out after the global financial crisis. So people knew what, what to do. There was not much hesitation about that. Uh, and this time, I think the big difference is that fiscal policy has been much more stronger than after the 2008 crisis. And related to your first question, uh, I think the crisis showed that fiscal policy works when it's tried. And all around the world, we have different governments from, from China to the US to Europe to Latin America adopting massive income transfers programs to attenuate the impact of the, of the lockdown of the isolation policies. And that where, where that was adopted, uh, the fall in GDP was small. And the economy recovered, recovered very fast. So I think the, one of the, the lasting lessons of the, the pandemic is that income transfers work. You can reduce poverty quickly. And then the next question is now, can we continue to do that or not? Some countries have different fiscal spaces. So maybe Europe and the US has much more space to continue those transfers than Latin America. The quick recovery led to uh, 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 some pressures in, in some prices. Uh, the shutdown and the surge in demand for goods, especially durable consumer goods, created bottlenecks in many, many sectors. And in the globalized work of, of global value chains, that disrupted production everywhere. We're seeing a disruption in production in automobiles all around the world from a shortage of ships and conductors and all that. So that also put in question uh, the resiliency of, of the current uh, system of production. Many, many countries now, relating also to our first question, are, 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 are reevaluating whether they should really be so dependent on global value chains. We have movements of clear industrial policy adopted in Europe and in the US to try to relocate some of some production to their territories, not to be so exposed to this disruption in global value chains. But as of now, the demand for consumer durable, durable consumer goods are still going up, services recovering, so inflation is picking up. This happened before. There was an, a, an acceleration of inflation in 2010 and 11, but now it seems stronger. It seems stronger in the US, where you guys are having an inflation of 5%, and in Europe, by European standards, because Europe is going to inflation between two and three, which is high in, in Europe. Uh, is, this is mostly due to this, uh, I would say, uh, supply constraints yet. Uh, some people are talking about uh, stagflation and all that. I think that's premature, because when the world had that, it came after a decade of, of very fast growth. It came on the back of two deep supply shocks. Even this current increase in the oil price that we're seeing this week is moderate by historical standards. Oil prices are going up to 75. They were at this level in 2011, so maybe something going back to normal. But this creates temporary pressures. Central banks in the developed world so far are waiting to, to, to see how long this will last. The general perception of this inflation spike is transitory. They will require some adjustment interest rates, but not very much. But any small move in interest rates in advanced economies calls, causes a huge shock in emerging markets. When you have a 50 basis point, 1 percentage point change in the US interest rate, that creates uh, an asset rebalancing, a portfolio reallocation all around the world that affects uh, capital markets, stock markets in the developing world. So I think. Uh, despite the concerns being concentrated mostly in the US and a little bit in Europe, the effects are being mostly uh, felt in the development world. Just to give you an example, in Latin America, the impact of, of the crisis was very deep. The economies, almost all economies went down by 5 or 8%. The economies are not yet out of the, the recession, and they are not expected to be out of the recession by mid, mid of next year. But all around the region, central banks started to hike because international pressures coming from commodities and from the valuation of the domestic currency are increasing inflation. So it's really a, 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 a challenge uh, to deal with that. 
uh, so far, I, I'm not too busy with the current US uh, position because US central banks are still not buying in the, in the inflation scare. And, but the interest rates will probably go up. And some people portray that, especially in the US debate, as a failure. It's not a failure. Because one of, the, one of the big debates of the last 10 years was called secular stagnation, if you remember that. One of the things of secular stagnation was that the economy did not recover fast, so interest rate has to be very low for a long time. So it's natural that if the current recovery is stronger, sometime in the near future, interest rates will go up by a moderate value. So I think that's what's going to happen in the US and maybe in Europe, but it's still too far ahead in Europe. And this will not cause a big crisis, I think, in the US, but it will cause uh, a financial shock for emerging markets. So to that point, um, there's ma massive inequalities in, in how countries have fared um, throughout the pandemic. And you know, we know the tools that the US or the, the European countries have at their disposal to help people. Um, it's a little more complicated when you are the treasury um, of the US, for example. Uh, so I'm interested in, in hearing what you all um, have to say. What tools do um, poorer countries, developing countries have at their disposal at this point? And how much does that depend, does their recovery depend on everybody else um, and on the global community? I mean, I think, you know, obviously, if for us, I, I worry a bit more than Nelson, I think, that inflation is being used as a ruse to go back to a kind of business as usual type policy regime. That's that's a worry I have that that's a, but I'm, and we're hearing noises about that in Europe, um, less in the United States, that's, that, that's certainly true, but certainly in, in Europe, we, we begin to hear that. Um, there's still a, somehow a belief that countries can export their way out of this kind of crisis. And we're hearing that in the context of WTO reform, that we need to get back to more trade liberalization, more flexible labor markets as the way to ensure countries are competitive and that they, and as we all know, it's impossible for all countries to compete their way out of a, of a, of a crisis like this. So I think there is a, we have, there is a concern and it's expressed in the report that, that there is, despite these changes that you've talked about at us and that we talk about in the report in terms of these unprecedented government responses in certain areas, there is this fear that, that we, as we did after the 2008, 2009 crisis, that we will go prematurely into fiscal um, uh, 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 contraction and, and, and adopt a more familiar kind of neoliberal strategy. And I, obviously for us, it's, I mean, if that happens, I think it is developing countries that will get damaged the most, and and therefore that fear that that you know a, a contraction or, or or a more contractionary or or, or uh, um, a tighter response in the advanced economies will ripple very rapidly across the developing world is a fear, and and the lack of coordination in the global economy right now is something that we we emphasise particularly in this report. The G20 is a largely hapless kind of body at the moment in terms of uh, ensuring that we have a, a, a more coordinated response uh, that works in a, in, a, in a reasonably expansionary way across the global economy. So that's, I think we have that, we have that concern. And, and for many, and particularly for, I mean, and Nelson can speak of the larger economies, but for many smaller open economies in Africa, for example, it's very difficult to see them being able to employ the tools that they need themselves, for example, without a significant amount of debt relief. These are very highly indebted econ uh, economies. Many of them are, are, are already under serious debt, were already under serious debt distress before the pandemic hit. Uh, all of them have taken on further debt in response to managing the crisis. Uh, you know, if we get the kind of, uh, if we return to a higher, a, a somewhat higher interest rate, regime globally it's not it's not clear what will tip those economies over but many of them are on the edge already and therefore some coordinated response to deal with these very high levels of indebtedness is certainly a necessary uh, for a for a broad based uh, recovery to include uh, those economies so I, I you know that i think the developing world is not 
as, homog as homogenous as, as we used to think. Uh, and for certain countries, it's very difficult for them to respond without very systematically without uh, a, a, a coordinated global response. Um, Anastasia, would you like to weigh in? I, I, I was wondering, maybe you have a sense of if any countries have done something that worked well or, or if there's really nothing out there, no models um, at this stage to follow, what's your sense? Well, I think, um, as Rocha said, it's not a homogeneous kind of collective anymore. Um, it, it's, it's really groupings of very diverse uh, political economies. Some in developing economies, or sometimes they're called emerging markets, have managed to withstand the crisis because they had some um, export earnings that were accumulated in various funds and that, that allowed them. Some have some capacity to tax. Um, they all are part of international forums to, to negotiate and, and to, to try to coordinate policy or a decision. But of course, these forums need to be used and um, there is coordination expected also on, on behalf of the developing countries, which uh, probably something to be aiming for uh, if, if a, a really serious solution to a global problem is to be found. Um, at the same time, I think, you know, we really need to get down to earth in, in, in developing countries tools. Um, these are economies that are dependent on this, on key decision making structures controlled by advanced economies. And these are economies that are vulnerable and exposed to huge financial and corporate interests that usually are not there or not theirs. So that's uh, structurally, they're in a weak position. They're also weakened by environmental crises that have hit them and will hit them hardest um, in the near future. So we can talk about what can they do to retain or attract capital. We can talk about some state capacity, but in a proportionate level of, you know, advanced vis-a-vis -vis developing economies, these are these are not the same conversation. Sure. Um, well, this leads me to another really huge question, um, which is that of multilateralism and, and the state of it today. Um, at, at the beginning of the pandemic, which again seems like a really long time ago, um, I remember there were all of these com comments and op-eds and, and things saying, oh, globalization is dead which seemed crazy to me at the time because isn't that how we got here in the first place? Um, and you know, these, co these comments keep popping up and I guess it's a debate, um, but it's also clearly not dead because the pandemic has showed how interdependent economies are. And, and it's not just rich countries depending on rich countries, it's, it's really a, a whole web um, of dependence. And at the same time, I think it was, uh, Nelson mentioned, um, re bringing industry back um, closer so as not to be so vulnerable on the global value chain. So you have these kind of competing currents. Um, how do you all see multilateralism evolve um, and how, how have the events of the past 18 months um, changed the conversations around things like the global climate talks uh, that are upcoming or this proposal that we're hearing about a global minimum corporate tax? Um, would these things have come about anyway? What, have, what is the impact of, of COVID on these, you know, in theory, big and hopefully world-changing um, agreements? I want to start. Well, first on the financial side, I think multilateralism is necessary, especially to, to assist, as we should put, small open economies. Uh, we, there are many, many countries in the world that simply don't have ability to adopt policies that they would like to do uh, because they don't have a domestic way to finance uh, their budget deficits. They're usually facing a debt constraint, a foreign exchange constraint. And uh, the solution for that has been the one that UNCTAD has been advocating for a long time. Longer uh, loans, longer, longer term finance, some kind of, of, of debt relief. Uh, that, that, that will help. And this is actually for, in terms of value for the world economy, peanuts. People are more worried about the moral hazard of this, if you will. But at the, at the other end, you have to, to, to take in the human cost of not doing, of not doing enough. Uh, 
When you go to large emerging economies, the, the question is really more about volatility than finance. What hurts most is the abrupt changes in the exchange rate, abrupt changes in commodity prices that creates too much volatility. And again, the last 10 years showed a good way to deal with that. You don't have to provide necessarily finance, you have to provide uh, an insurance, if you will, against volatility. This is usually done by exchange rate swaps. The agreements between central banks, where the central banks of the advanced economies support uh, part of the volatility of the emerging market currencies. The US has been doing that with selected countries. I think this should be expanded and done globally by the IMF. That will help a lot countries like Brazil, Argentina, Turkey, some countries that are large, but still very hurt by volatility. The other part of multilateralism is this tax policy, as you said. This was dead. 40 years of trickle-down economics uh, basically burned any, any global initiative to raise taxation on the rich on capital income. Now this is changing mostly due to the sudden uh, change in the US position. For a long time, being Democrat or Republican, the US was against a global initiative to raise taxation on the rich. The Biden administration signaled in favor of that, but there's still a long way to go, as you know yourself in the US, you're debating that currently in Congress. But I think that's a very good move, even though the initial tax, minimum tax rate is, is set to be 15%, is considered low, but it's a beginning. But it's still too early to know whether it's, it's going to succeed or not. I think the increase in inequality during the pandemic, where you have the surge in, in, in asset prices that makes, say, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, and all those guys extremely rich during a pandemic, that made it clear or, uh, another, uh, another time, for the third or fourth time, that we need to, to face this inequality. Uh, there should be some cap on maximum wealth, not only a, a floor on poverty. And this is, but this is difficult to do because it's, it must be done globally. It's a question that Europe and the US and Japan has to agree with. And if they agree on something, the rest of the world will eventually follow. The third part of multilateralism has to do with direct assistance in investment and generating jobs. This is lacking. Muktad has talked about a, 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 a green global new deal, a new Marshall plan, which is direct investment in the less developed part of the world. China was trying to do that due to its geopolitical interest in the global uh, in the Belt and Road Initiative, but now they seem to be reevaluating that. The US seems to start something in that, but still just on announcements, there's not really concrete. And Unktad has, point, has pointed out in the last 20 years that we knew some sort of new Marshall Plan focus on improving infrastructure in a, in a sustainable way. And this means boosting investment in the less developed parts of the world, providing the finance or the direct assistance with no uh, cost for the less developed uh, regions. Maybe, and I'm concluding, linking to your, the last part of your question, Maybe the, 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 the climate uh, challenge will be a way to do that. But since this is naturally a global issue, it has to be tackled globally. That creates a, how can I say, a political justification for rich countries to put money in outside their, their territories to, to face this. I think that, that that's, uh, uh, this is the challenge of our generation. Right, if you frame it as a self-preservation for the rich countries as well, maybe they'll be a little bit more willing to lend a hand. Um, Anastasia, would you like to weigh in on this big question of multilateralism? Well, it's very much going to what Nelson was just saying as, uh, generally, but also the last point and what you just pointed out, the self-preservation. Uh, multilateralism is a academic term. It has been with us for a while. It's just supposedly, it was associated with globalization, which was also supposed to be based on multilateralism. It's just that until about early 2000s, multilateralism de facto functioned as a unilateralism with everybody passively admitting kind of US hegemony or American leadership in most political economic affairs globally. Uh, it stopped really working that particular model, or it really stopped being effective. Um, there are many reasons for that. Part of 
the part, part is the rise of bigger um, developing economies or emerging markets, uh, partly the, the waning of, of um, economic and definitely, as you said, some political weight of advanced economies. But really, there was this more qualitative change to what multilateralism is now, as opposed to what it was, let's say, in 1995. And now it appears that um, we still have the same kind of the same nominal players globally, the key decision makers, they're the same, they're the US, they're the European Union or Euro bigger European economies, there are some um, Asian countries too. Um, but unlike, let's say, what it was in, in the 80s or even 1995, US leadership, which is kind of still with us, there is, there are Biden initiatives, we outline them in the report, they're positive initiatives, they're needed initiatives, but it's a necessary but, but no longer sufficient condition um, for a, a truly global step towards something bigger, better, and more sustainable, because others are not joining, others can remain indifferent, or they, they can take a non-decision, a very passive non-decision not to join with the, for example, vaccine initiative or debt, debt waiver initiative or debt restructuring initiative or a climate initiative. And this ultimately, although in the short term, it could appear very uh, kind of tempting to at least to sell us to the domestic uh, political audiences if somebody's running for an election that we didn't contribute so much, we're not wasting money on aid. But in the medium to long term, it's actually fatal to um, advanced countries themselves, as you said, because it's an issue of self-preservation. There are real dangers coming from um, growing markets from developing countries. They are associated with climate change. Uh, it probably is the only way now to mobilize sufficient long-term serious resources for infrastructure development, for sustainable growth, for uh, inclusive trajectories of, of socioeconomic kind of, let's say, again, development. Um, and without it, it will be uh, not very pretty. Um, the economy will still be global. It's just that it will be um, fractured and damaged. Yes, unequal for sure. But, you know, the, there are consequences to inequality. And these consequences can be very damaging for advanced economies themselves. Yeah, um, well, this seems like a, a good form to talk a little bit about history. Um, at the beginning of UNCTAD's, um, you know, establishment, uh, there, you know, there was the non-aligned movement, there was um, the new international economic order, uh, there was sort of a lot of, at least for a moment, solidarity among global South countries, banding together, trying to sort of have a, a, an amount of power leverage um, against the wealthier countries in the world. And it occurs to me that we might also, I mean, we hope, right, be in a place now where the doors are open for that um, type of action. Um, Richard, maybe you could speak a little bit about um, where I'm said, where, where, where this movement was, uh, I guess at this point, 60, 70 years ago, and whether you have any, any shred of optimism um, for the next 40 to 70 years. I mean, I mean, there are these kind of, you know, spots uh, or small developments that I think are encouraging, right? I, and that's true of, for example, South-South cooperation, the emergence of new financial players, the Asia in, uh, Infrastructure Investment Bank, the New Development Bank, uh, regional regional financial arrangements. Of, I mean, they're, they're still on a, a, the kind of, a, not at the kind of scale that is probably required to really um, challenge the the dominant uh, financial the, the dollar the dollar centered financial system, but they're kind of they, they've 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 been important developments over the particularly over the last fifteen years. I, I think that we we have certainly welcomed in in UNCTAD. Um, I mean, there's a certain we I guess we find ourselves in a slightly ambiguous position, right? I mean, we spent 40 years in a way criticizing the Washington institutions for the way in which they have um, uh, uh, perpetuate, promoted and perpetuated what we think is the wrong development model. At the same time, we need, these are, these are, the, these are the only institutions we have that can somehow bring a degree of, of um, 
coherence and coordination and stability to the system, which is what they were set up to do, of course. Um, and, and they themselves now, I mean, I read a number, I've read a piece recently where some, one of the senior IMF official complained essentially of being put out of business by large central banks in the advanced world because you know the fed is pump it's not the imf that's putting money into the system it's the, it's the federal reserve with various swap arrangements with chosen or with favored uh, uh um uh, central banks in the in the developing and the developed world etc so uh you know and 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 the and the world bank is an institution that we have long criticized but you know is having now to deal with the climate challenge in a way and to think about how he can better mobilize resources the you know so 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 you know there's a certain ambivalence i think about about some of the steps that we we welcome the use of special drawing rights is a is a very important you know this new allocation huge allocation of 650 billion dollars of special drawing rights is a very important step we've argued it's not on the scale again that is is required and the scale that is required raises all kinds of political positions become it becomes a much more political it's already been politicized in the context of the us it would be much more politicized if we if we talked about a trillion dollar special drawing rights uh, issuance and it would begin to challenge the dollar and and that raises all kinds of geopolitical challenges you know, on the other hand, the, the way in which the vaccine question has been handled can't bring anything but despair in terms of uh, uh, talking about the multilateral system. Uh, the resistance to the, the waiver initiative uh, that was uh, um, uh, uh, pushed into the WTO by the South Africans and the Indians is quite shocking uh, in many respects. And, and you compound that with the fact that northern countries are hoarding uh, uh, large amounts of vaccine, even as they've, you know, vaccinated 75% of their population when only 2% in Africa is that, I mean, these are shocking kind of limitations of, 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 of the multilateral system. So it's, it's, I mean, it's, you know, there are things to be positive about that we need to kind of emphasize and push and stress, but whether the geopolitics of the, of the moment We'll see that become the basis of a new consensus, or or continue along what seems to be a fairly fragmented uh, direction, which is I think where we are we are at the moment. Is I, I guess we 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 will we will we will wait and see. Um, I mean I, I we do we have people a bit critical of us, but we have taken encouragement from the Biden administration. I think you know I think there's it, it it's. They, they've done a lot more than many people expected. Um, you know, on the tax question that you raise, I mean, that was unthinkable, I think, a decade ago in the United States, and they resisted that. And that, you know, again, we say that it's not on the scale that's, that's actually required, that 15% that is, is a figure that a lot of large corporations will not find it difficult to circumvent, given their... The, the, the practices that they are now masters of. But, you know, it's definitely something that needs to be welcomed and, 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 and it's, at the end of the day will require the developing world, I think, to become, you, you talked about the, you set the new international economic order. I, I mean, the developing world is less solidaristic today than it was in the 1970s. So that real political push, that countervailing power uh, uh, is, is it doesn't really feel it's there at the moment. I mean, the rise of China has been important, but, but a wider sense of, of solidarity within the South that could actually contest the rules of the game doesn't yet feel it's in place. Mm -hmm. um, thanks for that. It's a really interesting answer. Um, I think, so we have 15 minutes left and I'm going to um, address a couple of questions we've got and also invite the audience to uh, type in more questions. We'll get to everything we can. Um, one question uh, I got from uh, Fulvia Farinelli um, re is regarding um, different types of um, ways to access financing for development and climate adaptation. Uh, Richard, I think, or a number of you mentioned special drawing rights, but what is there, what mechanisms are there besides that, or in addition to that, um, that um, countries can, can can go to uh, for assistance. Um, Fulvia's question was specifically about um, Latin American countries, but I think this is a you know 
across the board a really important question to, to address. Well, Nelson might want to pick up that because there are regional arrangements too, including in Latin America that, that are quite Obviously, you know, we've always insisted on a much greater role for various types of concessional lending windows through through both the IMF and the World Bank. They're not again, they're they're there and they're there, and the, and the IMF has opened a number of new concessional window uh, windows in in response uh, to the to the pandemic. They they're, they're not on the scale that that is required. I think the IMF has actually lent less to developing countries in this crisis than it did during the 2008-2009 crisis, even though the scale of the crisis in much of the developing world has been, has been, um, uh, has been greater. So, I mean, you know, the, mecha the IMF, when, you know, it, it, was, it was set up by people who knew what they were doing, and it has all the elements in place, I think, to be able to respond. But it does. It, it, there is a, there are ideological um, challenges, but there are also uh, financial challenges themselves. They're not sufficiently capitalized to be able to lend on the kind of scale and with the flexibility that I think is conditionalities remain a major problem. Excessive conditionalities remain a major problem uh, in, when it comes to uh, the lending practices of the Washington in institutions. You know, and that's a, that's an issue with the special drawing rights. There's a big debate going on about about rechanneling special drawing rights, which which you know are essentially a liquidity generating tool into some sort of uh, longer term financing mechanism, and and which I think is something that we support. The, the problem is if you use the Washington institutions to do that, then the the what is a non conditional financing tool, which is special drawing rights, they, they don't come with policy conditions attached to them, becomes a conditional tool if it's channeled through some of the uh, funding windows of the Washington institution. So, I mean, there's, I think, you know, there's a lot that can be used. A lot, unfortunately, has been distorted by the fact that these institutions themselves embrace neoliberalism over 40 years, and those practices are very much still entrenched in the in the day-to-day -day operations of of, the, of, of those institutions. Um, yeah, I'd love to hear from Nelson. I'm gonna just uh, mention that we had another, uh, Nabil Abdo says um, that uh, a lot, uh, 85, I'm not sure which um, survey this is referring to, but 85% of IMF COVID-19 loans to countries have encouraged countries to return to austerity through fiscal consolidation when the pandemic abates. So this is maybe a twist, um, uh, but uh, maybe you could address that as well, uh, Nelson. Well, for, from a developing country perspective, especially maybe focus too much on Brazil, there are many sources of foreign finance, uh, but they're mostly focused on forest preservation or, or to diminish deforestation, which is a huge problem here. So ironically, one way to deal with that may be to impose environmental conditions on lending, private lending through regulation, the whole EISG debate on finance right now. So that may actually push uh, uh, the, the market to support more environmentally friendly projects and all that. The other part is what we should say. Uh, to preserve the environment, you have to invest. And, and maybe you, you're going to have to give not only loans, but actually uh, uh, cost-free resources. As we were talking earlier, well, it's, it's, it's about self-preservation. So maybe a, a concession of funds uh, to, to preserve the environment. Uh, in emerging markets, in some countries like Brazil, Indonesia, uh, parts of, of West Africa, that should be focused mostly on avoiding deforestation. But it's not only that. Uh, most of the, the, the people in developing countries live in cities. So it's just a re-urbanization. It's basically urban development, urban transformation. And since that has a, a, a global benefit, uh, I think the source of finance should be should be made with conditions regarding the environment and social issues, but not with austerity necessarily. Obviously, nobody nobody wants the public debt to explode. There are many ways to to deal with that. The problem is that they they, they are usually attached with financial constraints, and not enough. They they don't come with enough social and environmental constraints. Uh, but there's there's plenty of liquidity in the world. The problem is not a, a, not a lack of liquidity. The problem is a, a lack of willingness to divert the funds. And as we were saying, uh, 
a, a lack of an institution to bear the volatility risk. Because you're going to invest in domestic currency, but you're going to borrow in international currency. And we know that these things fluctuate a lot. And that was created in one of the reasons to be great is exactly to deal with that. So uh, uh, there are ways to do that, as Richard was saying. The Federal Reserve is already doing that for its own with selected countries. We should do that, reduce volatility, and also attach that to green finance. Uh, it's not it's not quantum physics. People know how to do that. It's more a political decision. Mm -hmm. um, so I have one question that wasn't framed framed as a question, but I think there's a way to to make it a question. And it's um it's a comment that it's going to be really hard to solve all of these problems, particularly in places like Sub-Saharan Africa, um, as long as a large percentage of the population live in informal economies. And that besides investing in physical infrastructure, we should talk about social infrastructure, um, helping civil society, helping um, ordinary people organize economic alternatives and um, you know, cooperatives, community health centers, et cetera. This actually ties in partially to the sustainable development goals that the UN has set. Uh, and since we have eight minutes left, maybe this is a good chance to talk about COVID-19, the SG, SDGs, and, you know, has this really been, have they been sidetracked? Side and it has, how big of a setback has COVID-19 been for the SDGs? Um, yeah, it, well, it's a massive setback. It also, that's clear, just the, the, the scale of the financial hit. I mean, we argued in, 20, in the 2019 Trade and Development Report that for many parts of the developing world, even then before the COVID hit, the sustainable development goals were not realizable, partly because of the of the debt burden that they were carrying, uh, partly because they'd been deprived of the kinds of, I mean, the, the, the good thing about the SDG or the Agenda 2030 is it's a transformative agenda. I mean, it, it, it's, it, it understands that there are structural problems facing the developing world that need to be overcome. And you need a broad policy toolkit to be able to do that. I mean, for example, you need industrial policy. You can't make these kinds of big transformational changes, deal with the problem of informality, uh, deal with the problem of rural uh, degradation without you know, active industrial policy and support. So, so you know, that, that was a problem before COVID-19 hit, and it's certainly become uh, more of a problem uh, uh, as a consequence. You know, we've we've pushed the narrative. I, I think one of the weaknesses of the SDGs before it was it's a it's a you know it's a list of things that everybody wants to see, right? We all no one's going to disapprove of them, either the goals or the targets. It lacked a narrative about the the way in which you can marshal resources, uh, employ policies make the necessary trade-offs because you know you can't get all of these things policy making is a is a is about trade-offs and it's about confronting uh, entrenched interests that oppose some of these i mean you you have to have a narrative that can somehow link these things together the sdgs never had that we've argued that the global green new deal or the green new deal provides that kind of narrative that can allow you to marry these objectives with a more coherent kind of understanding of the policy trade-offs and the institutional reforms that are needed so so we have we we, we you know we've tried to rethink the SDGs in, through, that kind of, through that kind of lens. Um, but, you know, there's no doubt that this is, it's a setback. At the same time, given what we've all said, it's also an opportunity, right? I mean, all the things that you need for a global Green New Deal have kind of, in one often, you know, in, insufficient ways, have kind of emerged out of the pandemic. The question is whether, whether those green shoots I mean, I guess it's appropriately green shoots, um, will become the basis of a kind of new consensus, a different type of development model, and a more inclusive kind of multilateralism, or whether they will be fairly rapidly uh, cut down and we will go back to, to, to business as, uh, as, as usual. I mean, I guess ultimately that is a political question as much as a as a technocratic question. I mean, the policies are there, the resources, we, the, the world doesn't lack resources. We have huge resources, we found that. We, we don't, we, we have lots of innovative policy thinkers. We're not short of those, we have those too. What we, well, the, the big question is whether the political economy 
uh, aligns in a way that, 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 that mobilizes those for this notion of, a, of a, a greater and collective good or not. Well, we have four minutes. Um, if anyone else wants to weigh in or uh, make any final remarks, now is the time. The floor is open. As I just want to make a quick remark. I think the pandemic shows that nobody is, should be invisible. It's one thing for a person to have to be to have a formal job or not a formal job, a steady income or irregular income. That's an economic issue. But in today's world, with all this uh, information technology, with all the tools that we have available, nobody should be invisible in emerging markets, developing markets, advanced economies. When it was needed, the countries mobilized to vaccinate their population. It's, that still has to be expanded to less developed countries. And I think we learned from the massive income transfers that we, the government policies can reach may, more people and you can build, say, if you will, a database or a registry or whatever, and suit your policies to the necessities of different groups of society. So public health can reach everybody, income transfers can reach, reach everybody, and I think employment as well. But that's the third step down the road. And I think the, the, the learning from this, from the pandemic, maybe will push governments to that. And on a last note, the pandemic is not over. We still have to deal with the consequences of COVID. There's a generation of young people, students, that have been hurt deeply by the suspension of classes, by the, the, their, their education, their long-term perspectives, maybe uh, permanently hurt by the pandemic. So we will need more investment in education globally in the world to, to, to deal with the consequences of, of the social isolation, not only in health. And I think that's a classic investment in the future. And this should be supported also, as we were saying, by multilateral institutions, governments, whatever. It's an it's a, it's a urgent need for the post-COVID world. Anastasia, you get the last word. Yeah, the last word. I'll just pick up from what Nelson was saying. Um, it's a little bit abstract, but along with many other things that pandemic possibly pushed us to rethink um, our macroeconomic categories. It's actually quite clear that not only the key macroeconomic model is quite outdated, but also what is involved there. And that our economies or habitats or socio economies are much more complex. There is um, a universal informality. There are new types of wealth. They're not really being measured. Um, there are people who are invisible, but who should not be. There are types of work that are not on the register. So maybe on a positive note, this is clearly something that an international community in terms of international economic institutions can at least start doing something about as to kind of adapt key macroeconomic indicators or measurements um, applied globally uh, to 21st century reality. So social development goals, environmental concerns, but also all the kind of outside of the mainstream types of economic activity or, or activity that should be counted as economic uh, can be part of the new, let's call it new consensus. It's a very kind of rosy uh, blue sky thinking, but something that clearly has been exposed by the crisis. Well, here's hoping. Um, thanks again, everyone, for your contributions and for this wonderful report. Um, I really hope a lot of policymakers take it seriously and follow your recommendations. Um, and um, I guess maybe see you next year. But the, thanks again, and thank you for uh, coming to all the attendees. Frank, um, can I well, just, well, just to thank you, Atossa, for moderating. I should just say that this is only the first part one of the GDI. There's always a thematic part and in, this, in the theme of resilience, this year it will be on climate adaptation. We are gonna launch that later uh, in, uh, next month because it's an issue that's gonna arise in the context of the Glasgow COP. And therefore we thought it more appropriate to release that part of the report um, uh, closer to uh, early November when the COP uh, takes place. So the people who have not had enough yet of the TDR this year, there is more to come. Well, I look forward to it. All right, thanks. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.